Welcome everyone to the importance of the youth vote. As the 2020 election nears, America's young, youngest generation, known as Generation Z, is energized for political change. Most of us are born after 1996, with the oldest among turning 23 this year. That's around roughly 24 million voters who have the opportunity to cast a ballot this November. With young Americans forming the backbone of a lot of protests around racial injustice and structural inequality in the United States, many people are wondering if this is going to be a pivotal moment for us Gen Z students, where activism will turn into voting. Many of the pundits and candidates are calling this time an inflection point in our country's stories. With the 2020 election nearing by, just around the corner, we're going to see if our vote truly impacts the outcome of this crucial election and ultimately the future of our country and the American experiment. Well, I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm the president of Unruh Associates. My name is Tommy Wynn. I'm a junior here at USC studying international relations and history. Unruh Associates is a bipartisan political organization here at USC focused on both civic okay. engagement and civil discussion. We host various debates and events aimed to connect students with political opportunities. And I'll be turning it off to Ria, my co-moderator as well. Hi everyone, my name is Rhea. I'm currently a junior studying history and business. I am here to represent Vote SC, so we're a nonpartisan org on campus. You've definitely seen my face or one of my uh, eboard members' face as we popped into your classes encouraging voter registration. I've also thrown our voter link, our USC specific voter registration link, um, and hopefully after today's event, you're more encouraged to vote. Um, and so we'll go ahead and get our let our panelists introduce himself. So we'll kick it off to Ben for a brief introduction. Sure. So my name is Ben Sheehan. And in 2018, I started an organization called OMGWTF, which stood for Ohio, Michigan, Georgia, Wisconsin, Texas, and Florida. Uh, my background is working at Funny or Die, uh, running a super PAC for Joss Whedon in 2016 that used videos to get 50,000 people to register to vote. And going into 2020, I wanted to focus on civic education. So I wrote this book, called OMGWTF Does the Constitution Actually Say, which is basically a casual guide, sort of article by article, amendment by, by amendment in modern day English, vetted by constitutional law professors on what actually is in our founding document. All right, thank you for that. Tanasi, if you wanna go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, my name is Tanasi Dilos. I'm 17. Um, I just graduated high school. I'm taking a gap year to work on an organization that I co-founded called Civics Unplugged. Um, started a year ago, we have a fellowship of uh, 500 young people that we run January to July. Um, and then after the fellowship, we build a community of um, students, high school students, uh, focusing on democracy reform, making it easier for people to vote, and really pushing the system forward. Um, and we provide small grants. We uh, have just partnered with the Rhodes Scholarship and Schmidt Futures to work on um, some global youth empowerment. So that's what, that's what I'm up to. All right, great. And then last but not least, Merritt, you want to go ahead? Hi, I'm Merritt. I am a senior advisor at Student Voice. We're an entirely student-led 501c3 made up of high school and college students from across the country, really working to equip students to take action on the issues they care about in their schools. Um, guided by a Student Bill of Rights, our team created a number of years ago. And so we're doing a lot of work this round, thinking about how we engage young people, specifically in school board elections. Um, I, I took a gap year and spent a lot of time talking to young people all across the country about civic engagement and trying to see schools as the first civic, engage, civic institutions we interact with to do a better job of uh, rethinking what civic engagement even looks like um, and voting being one of many of those things. All right, so before Tommy starts off with the first question, I'm just gonna go ahead and let our guests know. If you have any questions, please go ahead and throw them in the chat. Um, towards the end, we'll go ahead and pick through them and ask our panelists those questions. So if you have any, go ahead and throw them into the chat. Tommy? Yeah, thank you so much, Rhea. Well, you know, first off, I'm super excited. We have three amazing panelists, you know, all of us around, you know, similar young age. So my first question is, you know, oftentimes voters are often looked down upon by older citizens as being naive sometimes and lacking understanding of politics. So what is your response to statements like this? Are we just jumping in? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> all right. Um, I, I, I guess I, I guess I spoke first. I kind of volunteered myself for that one, huh? Um, I, I think that young people um, are kind of uh, disenfranchised in, in a lot of ways and disempowered. I think both parties benefit from the disempowerment of young people when it comes to voting and when it comes to politics. 
uh, I think young people feel like it's such an old institution and it's a lot of people in back rooms smoking cigars with expensive suit on, suits on deciding who represents them, which, you know, in some parts is true. But what I think older generations fail to realize is that young people um, have kind of seen the true system and are realizing that it's not only voting that makes a difference. They're taking to the streets. We're watching youth led movements, you know, even even like merits like like student voice, you know, taking over and and pushing reform that is not just voting and really making changes on their local systems and then through that their national systems. So I wouldn't say we we aren't uh, we don't understand politics. I think we just play a different and better game. I would say that younger generations understand politics a lot better than older generations in many ways. Um, you know, I think even when, especially when it comes to media literacy and media understanding, I mean, you know, misinformation spreads so much more easily, I think, among older voters, people who are not digital native, internet native, um, who don't know how to spot misinformation and the signs of it. And we're seeing that really rot uh, among uh, older, older generations of voters with regard to democracy. Um, but I, I really am inspired. I'm probably the oldest person on this Zoom, I'm, I'm now realizing, um, at 35. But um, I, you know, I, I wrote this book and was so inspired by a lot of the work that I saw younger generations do with regard to voting in, in 2018. And the truth is that civics education and, and Tennessee, you, you know, you and, and, and Merritt you as well can speak more to this, but you know, in the last 18 years has been really decimated in, in states and it's because of federal incentives and some state incentives as well. But, you know, we used to teach civics a ton and, and we would have classes like foundations of democracy and civics and American government and U S history in the fifties and sixties. And then that slowly whittled away. And today you only have eight states requiring a minimum of one year of civics and government K through 12. And so any sort of disdain among older generations of voters is kind of like, you know, they had a ladder to climb up over the wall and turned around and took the ladder with them and is like, why can't you guys get up the wall? Um, that's what it feels like to me with civics by not giving younger generations the tools. And so I think what, what I've seen as a, on the older side of the millennial generation has been really inspiring. And to be quite honest, and I'm not just saying this, I have way, way more faith in you guys than I do in older generations. And I would just echo the, the media literacy point um, as well as just the fact that young people are having a lot of experiences and experiencing school and experiencing a lot of things decision makers are making decisions about. And I think I, I think I like to say a lot is that we are all experts in our own experience. And we're also experts in a lot of other things too, um, like technology, like I think media literacy for a lot of young people. Um, and so just trying to highlight those things to people who, who think that young people are generally uninformed. And I, I think young people are easy targets because a lot of this is media portrayal. Um, you, you see, and I'm sure many of you watched as the spring rolled around and we were seeing people on beaches in Florida for spring break, right, as COVID was hitting. And I, that's the images we're constantly bombarded with and not the images of, of young people being able to um, engage or, you know, who are, and like all of you at your university, involved in civic engagement initiatives, involved in those things before you enter um, any kind of higher ed institution. So I think to me, it, it's very much a media narrative that perpetrates this idea that young people don't know what they're talking about or don't know what they're doing or don't care. Um, and I think for most of my peers and the hundreds of students I talk to um, over every week, that's just not true. Perfect. Thank you. So our next question is, you know, the topic of social media and social media has always been used to engage younger voters. But how have you seen this activism change, um, especially over the course of a pandemic? Merritt, if you want to start and then we can, or Ben, you want to mute it yourself so you can jump in and then we can go ahead. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think Social media on, you know, on one end can be uh, used to pollute our minds with misinformation, but at the same time, it can also be used to spread helpful misinformation. And I've seen that happen on uh, TikTok. I've seen that happen, especially on Instagram, people sharing, using the space that you have to, you know, share an image, to share text, to really break down things in digestible form. Um, so from everything from organizing, uh, um, you know, protests, really immediately to disseminating information, educational information, piece by piece. I think, you know, getting back to the civics portion, it's been younger generations that are sort of filling, filling the gaps, um, you know, post by post uh, to help educate, you know, peers 
rather than you know having to uh, wait for it to be handed handed down to us. So when it comes to organizing, just the speed of which things can come together, um, and also with with um, the um, how widespread educational information has can become, especially on platforms like like Instagram. I think you know really, at least from what I've seen, it's being used in a way that I don't think Twitter and Facebook have been used. I mean, each platform incentivizes its own sort of natural behavior, right? So Twitter really uh, incentivizes uh, partisan warfare and people fighting and, you know, tweeting at somebody and getting into sort of combat. Um, Facebook, the, the shareability, but it's also really tied to, to identity and, and, you know, eliciting emotional outrage, whereas Instagram has some of that, but I've really seen this sort of like educational bent emerge with it that I haven't seen from my, you know, standpoint with, with some of the other platforms. Yeah, and I'll just add on to that, that another platform, um, particularly in the last week, Snapchat launched a new voter registration tool um, in app that has registered over 400,000 young people, um, which I think is really remarkable and something that I, I, I find really interesting that um, these companies are really taking up the mantle and, and doing it. And when they're not like a platform like TikTok, where you're not having um, the platform itself do that, creators have taken upon themselves to, to really push that and do that themselves. Um, and I would, of course, echo Ben's comments about Instagram really being a platform where young people, especially the summer, the rise of infographics and information it is making it more accessible. And also the rise of um, just like new and increased digital organizing. So much of what happened in the spring around primaries led to um, more states who are allowing voter online voter registration. Um, I'm at school in North Carolina where that was not something that was an option before um, COVID. And there's a couple of states who that's not the case for yet, but young people in those states are, are fighting for the, the ability to register online. And so I think that's certainly one bright spot we're seeing coming out of, of this election and how many more states are now getting access, like New York and North Carolina, um, getting access to online voter registration, which is, is really key to engaging uh, our generation for sure. Yeah, I also think that, you know, aside from from getting people registered to vote and educating them, I think social media has given young people or this generation, it's it's not even young people, but the more tech savvy generation, um, an easier way to put pressure on politicians, on elected officials, on companies who are who have been historically contributing to, you know, lack of equality in our country and, you know, spread of misinformation usually you know young people would have to go to the news or have to get a microphone and a podium to make comments or, or provide commentary on these really destructive institutions or destructive politicians and now you know everybody can be and it's been proven that they are their own microphone they have their own platform and you can get into arguments whether or not that's a great thing for the country but i think it is a, a step forward in democratizing the way we think about media and democratizing the way we think about you know, storytelling and power. Um, and I think young people have really benefited from this. I just really hope that we can get to a point where social media itself is, is a healthy um, pastime for, for a lot of young people as well, because it is, there are a lot of mental health concerns that I think people need to talk more about. I agree 100%. So as a follow up to that question is, young voters are given waves of information via social media. So what are some tricks that you have to differentiate between misinformation, useful information, and kind of how to filter through what's online? That's such a good question. Um, the only thing that, that I try to do is to stay off of infographic uh, Instagram. And, and for those people who don't know what that is, uh, it's just a lot of people with some you know, minor graphic design skill making a fact or a sentence look really, really nice so that people think that it's true, uh, which many times in many cases it's not. Um, social media I use as like a, a spark to learn more about an issue. So, you know, if I see something going on on social media, it's always best to go back to more trusted news platforms and, and look that up and, and kind of make your own conclusions. I don't think social media is a standalone um, replacement for traditional forms of education. I mean, I think I'd add um, and, and maybe challenge that a little bit in that, you know, a lot of the young people I'm working with have really found and used infographics in a way that I think have been really useful to the broader civic engagement space. And when I was on the phone with someone the other day who 
you know, is using their the access they have to university libraries to to funnel and get at information out to the general public in an accessible form. Um, I think with the rise of things like Canva, it does make this easier, which of course is a challenge because misinformation can be spread. But on the whole, I think a lot of good information is being put out there and especially things like voting when that information is really accessible and really easy to correct um, and also just easy to find. It just putting it out into a platform where young people can just see a date of, you know, when they need to register by, um, can get information about mail-in voting and these uh, early voting, these all these new forms of voting that we um, are less used to hearing about because we've always just traditionally shown up to the polls. Um, so I think that all that information is really useful. And as far as like, filtering things that are less useful, um, I, it definitely matters the amount of folks who are following it. Instagram, I know, has stepped up their game and trying to have mechanisms to allow people to report misinformation. Um, and so hopefully kind of that combined, especially Facebook in this election cycle is, is, is trying to do more. We'll see if that bet plays out um, compared to 2016. It's definitely something I'm really concerned about, um, but knowing fewer um, Gen Z folks are, are there. So really looking to Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, and other places for, for that information. Yeah, I think it's a really great point. And I also think that there are cost barriers to uh, more and more emerging cost barriers to um, traditional journalism online, which creates an opening for, for propaganda. So, you know, when you have the New York Times and the Washington Post and more traditional outlets adding a paywall, a subscription service, um, people who can't afford that are going to go look at more free sources. So I do think there is an importance and also in social media platforms are starting to incentivize people not, you know, sharing articles and clicking off of the site because they just want you to stay on the site all the time. So sending people to articles on other sites are, you know, are less incentivized uh, in the algorithms than the information staying on that platform. So because of that incentive, in the incentive, because of um, people not necessarily being able to afford, uh, you know, as more and more uh, fact-based journalism goes behind a paywall, I think there's sort of a responsibility to put out, um, you know, to, to counter uh, that sort of shoddy information with as much free, high-quality information as possible. Totally agree. I mean, to bring in some some current context, I, I read a Gallup poll a couple days ago. So I think it's something like 75% of, of young adults um, have never voted by mail and, and are going to, um, or have the, have the ability to now. And so if it, it's the responsibility of, you know, their peers and of kind of these grassroots organizations to educate them about how to vote by mail, about how to register to vote by mail and something that I'm really concerned about, but I really have no facts to back it up. So, you know, opinion alert, but I'm really worried that a lot of bad actors can, can use this kind of time of chaos to, influence people even getting the right information about how to sign up for a mail-in ballot. So it's, it's our responsibility, but it's also the responsibility of people at Facebook and people at, at Snapchat and TikTok to step up their game about how they, how they deal with misinformation and how they provide good information to citizens of, of every country, really. Yeah, well, awesome answers, y'all. Well, I just want to follow up one, with one more question as well, because, you know, as we know with social media, it's not a one-way discussion. You know, when we're posting articles, posts, and whatnot, there's the ability to swipe up and talk in the DMs. And for our, our organization, Unreal Associates, you know, we strive on having a bipartisan conversation. But with the pandemic and online culture, it's sometimes ha hard to have that conversation face-to-face. -face. My question is, how do you have a frank political discussion online with someone that you might disagree with? Um, well, I, uh, you know, I, 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 I respect bipartisanship. I also think it helps me more to approach it from a nonpartisan perspective, which is sort of a key distinction versus giving necessarily equal time to different like ideas, but just approaching it from a nonpartisan perspective. And something I did in the book is that I made sure to not mention Democrat, Republican, left, right, conservative, or liberal anywhere in the book and i've been getting feedback from pretty conservative outlets saying good things where is to me a lot of the ideas are you know characterized by 
leading Republicans as, you know, uh, power grabs, you know, making sure more and more people have the right to vote in this country, identifying things that it hasn't always been that non-citizens can't vote. Uh, we, you know, we don't have a federal voting age by law, technically. Um, you know, there are all these sort of, you know, the fact that D.C. and Puerto Rico can't vote uh, and don't have representatives in Congress, um, that people who live in, you know, millions of people who live in United States territories don't have uh, voting rights. Um, I think when you approach it from a nonpartisan perspective and don't mention left, right, conservative, liberal, um, Republican, Democrat, I think just seeing how the idea resonates rather than leading with it, because if you lead with a side or an ideology, you give someone an opportunity to disagree with it because the, so much of discrediting fairness is by creating a bucket and then putting that idea in the bucket. So people are disagreeing with the fact that it had, you know, Democrat tied to it or left tied to it versus just the idea on the surface. So if you can take those words out, still make the same argument, um, you're giving people, you know, you're not giving them upfront a way that they can kind of, you know, push back and disagree, in my experience. Yeah, I mean, I think this one's hard. Um, now more than ever, there's a lot of polarization. And even when you're not explicitly talking about parties, issues feel like they're also hard to talk about. Um, I, I definitely come from a very divided political family. And um those conversations are tough ones that I've, I've spent a lot of time engaging in. But I, I think I, my advice to young people is to, to try to stay rooted in issues, um, to talk about the problems, the policies, um, your lived experiences, because I think that's oftentimes what people, the big political pundits get, don't spend enough time and nuanced analysis on. And I think sometimes journalists as well um, who report on politics is that, you know, you can have um, just like wildly different lived experiences across geographies, across um, states, and just the way people experience public policy and, and certain policies are, are really different. And so I spent a lot of time during my gap year working on a, a special election in a congressional district that is actually Frank Underwood's district in House of Cards in South Carolina, where I'm from. And the kind of conversations I was having with voters there about things like healthcare, when, you know, South Carolina hadn't expanded Medicare and hadn't um, done a lot, they were having very wildly different conversations and experiences about not having access to any kind of healthcare than, um, you know, people who are in bigger cities or in places where they have easier access to clinics. And so I think I spent a lot of time talking about the issues, um, talking about I think podcasts are a great way to recommend um, and have a discussion on something that in kind of a lighter way. Um, so I think there's lots of tools you can use. We're definitely at no shortage of information and resources out there, but I think really focusing on the issues and having conversations without um, it being candidate driven is kind of where I've, I've seen um, the most space to, to have those hard conversations that are, that are really tough and really political right now. Yeah, and, and Tommy, to kick it back to your question about like the swipe up, you know, sometimes I, I used to think it was my responsibility to educate everybody that, that swiped up on my story, right? Or that, or that contacted you about politics, right? But, but sometimes, you know, you have to recognize that there are people that have their own lived experiences that contribute to their own views and no amount of arguing over text or email or whatever you argue on is going to change their mind. And, and, you know, young people have a, a limited amount of energy. They have college classes, high school classes, you know, jobs to, to focus on and, and real change comes from them putting their heads down and, and doing the work and not really uh, educating these one off people that, that are just there for some fun, uh, some fun arguments, which in my experience is, is quite a few. Awesome. Thank you. And another point as well, every time I go on Instagram or Spotify now, I feel like on the top bar, it's always like, go vote, go register to vote all this excitement about voter registration. Well, you know, it's not only vote people who are qualified for, to vote that go on Instagram or Spotify. There's a lot of high school students as well, people that aren't of the voting age. So my question is, what are some, what are some ways that you can get involved, even if you're not on the voting age, but you see this wave of activism sweeping across the country? Oh, I know, Thanasi and I both, um, this is a question we spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, in my work, my constituency that I, I work with at Student Voice is primarily high school students who are not yet eligible. Um, the bet we're taking this year is to double down on school board races. Um, 
elections that just very directly influence students' lives and having those students host school board town halls um, to put candidates on the record for issues they care about. Right now, things like removal of SROs from school and diversifying curriculum and issues that have been especially prevalent this summer are on the forefronts of minds of students. And so we're supporting them through hosting school board town halls. Um, They're also registering their peers and their families and doing some of that voter education work. Um, but I think also it's just the practice of of civic doing and learning and campaigning. Um, so I, I was involved in so many campaigns before I could ever vote. And I think there are so many tangible ways, especially now more than ever, text baking. And there's all these new accessible ways for young people from their own home to, to be really involved in the political process without um, being eligible to vote yet. And um, I know we had a comment in the chat earlier about 16, 17 year olds, we've done a lot of work with Vote 16, which um, there's two cities in California that it's on the ballot for. So in Oakland, um, it's on the ballot for school board races. And um, this passed in Berkeley. Um, it hasn't yet been instituted, which I think is kind of a key um, and a little upsetting to know that they haven't put the money aside to actually implement it. But in San Francisco, it's on the ballot. It came really close to passing. Um, it lost by two percentage points in 2016. Um, and if that wins, it's gonna set a huge precedent. Um, there's several um, municipalities in Maryland who do this and have seen increased voter reg- or voter turnout. So um, there there are efforts to get plugged into that work. And if you all are from California, um, definitely check out Generation Citizen, who is the group that leads that work because the laws are um, more amendable to to being lowered in municipalities in California than in a lot of other states. So yeah, that's what I'd say about um, those who aren't 18 yet. Yeah, I mean, I, I just echo merit. I think being civically involved is so much more than just voting. And young people have proven that they can do more than just voting and create more change than just voting. Um, I think Merit and I both believe that, you know, you just have to empower those kids. And uh, no matter what they're, what they're passionate about, as long as you give them the platform, they will make the change, no matter, or not, no matter if they can pull the lever for left, right, center candidates. Yeah, I would also add that I think in many uh, uh, states, you only have to be 16 to be a poll worker. So that's a really good thing you can sign up for is uh, organizations like Power of the Polls, uh, a number of others. Um, and you can also just start to follow your candidates and know who your representatives are so that when you are 17 and, you, you know, also in 16, 17 year olds in, in many states can pre-register uh, to vote. In many states, 17 uh, year olds can vote in the primaries if they'll be uh, 18 by the general. But just getting in the practice of knowing who your representatives are in the first place, you know, your state legislators, your federal legislators, um, people who represent and statewide offices like Secretary of State, you know, people on your school board, all these things, you know, start to connect the, the issues you care about to the people who, who really control them at the federal, state, and local level. Just getting in the habit of that um, is a great place uh, to start. All right, awesome. Well, I this is kind of a side question, but I just wanted to ask you, because when I was in high school, I think it was around freshman or sophomore year, it was during the, the uh, 2016 election, right before. We were all super excited talking politics. I remember one of my high school teachers kind of shushed us down. And he's like, there's three things you can't talk about in high school, sex, religion, and politics. But now I feel that's all we talk about in college. So I just wanted to ask, like, does political discussion have a space in high school education? I think it absolutely does. Um, I was taking a gap year in the 2000. 16, 17 school year and traveling all around the country, meeting young people. And I mean, that was the biggest frustration I heard um, when I was on the road that November. And right after that, so many schools were silencing people who were having very real reactions to an election on both sides that felt very um, impactful. And teachers were not allowing them the space to do it. And I think it's because they're scared. I think it's because teachers, of course, also have their own ideologies and are really worried about revealing them. Or if they're not worried, then I think um, sometimes it also causes problems. But the spaces I saw that done well, I think it's also socio-emotional um, learning issue. Um, when you're not, When we're not talking about the things that impact students' lives in the building and just pretending that they exist in a vacuum outside of the building, um, you're really not creating a school culture that is is useful to young people. And again, I think we say constantly in student voice is that 
schools are the first civic institution we meaningfully interact with, um, and they should prepare us for life outside its walls and to, to be citizens beyond um, graduation. And so really having space, not even just in civic classrooms, I think they often get relegated to civic classrooms or to U.S. government. Um, but I remember just the, the ones I saw that were most effective were places like advisory and homeroom where students from different backgrounds were given space to talk about it, to talk about what they were feeling and what they were hearing um, and why that mattered. And so, yes, they absolutely have a place in our schools um, and it requires some bravery and facilitation. Um, but I think oftentimes it's just opening up the floor and not having to have an expected outcome, but just providing a place for, for young people to talk about what's going on. Yeah, I mean, I just I just graduated high school and in my four years, I was really shut out of those conversations, and so were my classmates. But I, I, I also think it's a, it's a systems problem. Our, our, the education system is, is not working for the kids that are in it right now, and is not working to create leaders, educators, um, anyone for the 21st century and beyond. We don't teach high schoolers how to have conversations, um, real conversations that have a goal that, that you know, facilitate diverse opinions. We don't, we don't teach that in schools. You know, we don't teach a lot of things in schools, but, <laughs> but that's one of the things we don't teach. And, and when teachers are so scared of having these political blow-ups in their classrooms, it's, it's not because they're not good facilitators. It's because the administrators don't want them to even get into how to have conversation lessons because they want them to stick to core curriculum that is no longer serving young people. And I'll be the first one to say, and maybe this will come back to bite me in, in 10 years, but I'll be the first one to say that I don't think my curriculum in high school served me. And I, you know, credit to Merit and all the work that she's doing, but I was never able to speak out against it. There was no school board I can even go talk to. I didn't even know how to talk to my school board. So the, the problem is not that we're not having political conversations in schools. The problem is that schools are no longer serving kids. And we're seeing that outcome. We're seeing that this, the symptom is that these political conversations are always hard, harder for kids because we don't train them correctly. And that's just an opinion. I, I apologize. You know, just, just saying. Well, it's, it's an opinion that I share. And I would also say, you know, one way to think about it is how do you characterize the not just the lack of civics and government classes or, um, you know, events at schools or forums or any sort of discussion at its core, it's voter suppression. And when you don't teach people how things work, if you don't teach people how these things apply to their lives, take the age out of it. If they don't have the access to understand why this impacts their life, how it controls their life, how it affects their life, you're suppressing them from being involved by not explaining why they should be. And that's really the core of it is, is, is voter suppression. And yeah, I mean, you know, my school wasn't, um, uh, uh, it didn't disincentivize political discussions, but civics and government education or outlets for that were definitely a minority of what we learned and also finance. I mean, we didn't take any finance classes, personal finance, and I find it very suspicious and coincidental that classes around learning how to, you know, uh, uh, use your power and how to manage your money uh, are two things that are woefully overlooked in our schools. And it feels like it's more than just a coincidence. So how do we, you know, really get students? I mean, like, I mean, you guys are doing the work, you know, Merit and Tanasi, you guys are, 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 are leading the charge on this in many ways. So, um, you know, more and more people waking up to this. So sometimes it's going to have to be, you know, educating or creating these forums, you know, other places outside of schools, whether it's through books, whether it's through entertainment. Um, I think entertainment can be way more effective uh, instead of telling people what to believe and, and, and who to vote for or support, just explaining things and educating things, um, you know, picking up the mantle where media has fallen short, where our schools to fall in short. Um, you know, I think about people like uh, uh, John Oliver and others who use their platform to really sort of do uh, uh, education in a bit of a different way. So, uh, you know, I just think it's important to be honest about what's at the root of this, which I think is, you know, voter suppression, because certain people stay in power, the less others are involved. Okay, I 100% agree. And I, I think also another thing that Tommy and I are worried about and other voting initiatives on campus are worried about is what to do after the election. So November comes, it passes. So what are some ways that you can stay involved, get involved after the election?
Okay, perfect. I think we all can unmute now. Can we? Yeah, I can unmute. All right, cool. I thought I was put in all detention. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so just to repeat the question really quickly, how can we stay involved or even get involved after the election politically? So whoever wants to start that off. Um, I definitely think that, you know, it starts with, with learning who the people that just won are, who just won your, who, who's your new, mem maybe it's someone who's reelected, but who are your new members uh, of your neighborhood council, your city council, uh, your state legislature, your federal legislature, who's your new mayor, who's your new DA, who's your new sheriff, you know, oftentimes when we go to vote, we're playing catch up and we're learning who the people that have been running our lives for the last two, four, six years have been. I think it's an opportunity to take the initiative and learn proactively who these people are starting out so that we can follow them at the beginning of the job that we all just gave them through an election we're going to be paying their salaries, we're paying their benefits, we're paying their expenses with our tax dollars. We gave them their jobs, we're very much like their boss. Um, so I think it's an opportunity to pay attention and follow their work at the outset of their term rather than deciding if we want to, you know, give them more work uh, at the end of their term and we hadn't been paying attention, you know, the previous uh, number of years that they, they had that job. I, I think a lot of politics and, and, and issues are about passion for young people. I've seen a lot of my peers be very passionate about one issue or the other. And, you know, our elected officials are only going to go so far. Um, there's, there's only so much they can do with the current democratic system. And I think young people just need to find the issues they're passionate about and work with organizations, with youth led organizations, with nonprofits and, you know, do that work all year round. It's, it's becoming easier and easier to do, which is great. Um, so, yeah. I mean, that's definitely the work we're thinking about um, and the work I do and the work that youth activists do. I think things like the climate strikes and um, so much more has demonstrated that electoral power is only one small part of building political power. Um, I really think the best way to view it as is just as a tool for organizing. And it, it allows you to talk to more people. It allows you to talk to different kinds of people registering people to vote is just one way of many to start building political power and doing community organizing um, and it just being a call to action of, of many um, and what's most useful is, is getting to know the people who are running for office and holding their feet to the fire um, and engaging with them in a meaningful way and so all the strategy we're talking about at Student Voice around school board elections is providing students an opportunity to talk to board members so that when there is an issue that they're going back to their school board to engage, especially now when these meetings are more accessible than they've ever been because so much of so many of them are virtual and all you have to do is hop in a Zoom meeting to listen in and to testify. I think there is a really important opportunity to know that beyond November and, and we also know November is probably going to be messy, um, that there's going to be a lot of organizing happening um that's something we're prepared for um kind of during and after the election and because we're not going to know on november 4th who is is going to be the next president of the united states which i think is a, a scary thought in a time that there's a lot of uncertainty and so i think there's just a lot we can be doing to um meeting elected officials and the people who are running for office to to really be prepared to hold them accountable regardless of what happens um on november 3rd All right, I think that is going to be it for our questions. So as you can see, there's a lot of them in the chat um, that our guests want to ask you. So we can go ahead and start with Glenn, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask. I know we kind of addressed this brief briefly when Merritt um, brought up the 16, 17 year olds voting, but Glenn, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay. Um, so, uh, Glenn Bailey, sorry, I um, wasn't prepared to start my video quite yet, so I'm going to just go ahead and ask. So I, I put into the chat in terms of, you know, after November 3rd, in terms of the continuing involvement, um, there for a city of Los Angeles with 99 neighbor councils covering virtually every 
every portion of Los Angeles, a few exceptions, there is an opportunity given the neighborhood council elections are coming up next spring for young people to engage, not just voting, but also attending the meetings, speaking up during public comment, uh, getting on committees, um, and actually in some cases becoming candidates themselves and then organizing uh, electoral coalitions because the number of voters in neighbor councils, um, the high is like 3,000, uh, the low is less than 100. So there's a, there is an opportunity for um, young people to organize and make a difference. And But the problem is getting the word out, despite best efforts and best intentioned efforts, getting the word out to young people. And that was, I think the focus of my question is, is how to do that through the high school and even, even through college level, um, because you don't see the even 18, 19, 20 year olds uh, with few exceptions, you know, really involved at that, at that level, you know, and, and I realize it's not Congress, but it's the first level, you know, it's, it's local and it, it does develop into, you know, recommendations that go to city of LA, which can have a, a multiplier effect and other, you know, going up other levels. Thank you. So to maybe summarize the question a little bit, was it was it how to get younger people involved? Was is that a question that I think the question kind of there was how to get younger voters involved? I think it was also running for office, right? Like how do we get them involved in the process? And the point that you made about about local office is is really special. I think people see you know young people don't even see local office as as that important when it really is. I think. At least I believe that change starts very locally and it's very important to run for, for local office. Um, and it's the system is always going to push back, just like, like Ben was saying, against younger people running for office, just like Congress pushes back against younger senators um, and, and Congress people. Uh, the, the only thing that, that I could see as having a huge influence is the rise of social media um, backing those campaigns and the, and the rise of you know, Gen Z is very interconnected. I saw a question about Gen Z being interconnected on social media, and I think that that's very true. Young, young people have very easy access to information and opportunities like this, and I think that um, a lot of them, especially from that area, will probably take it up. All right, perfect. Thank you. So the next question that we had was from Isabella Bright. If you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, sure. Um, which question was it? I asked two. Either, I like the second one a little bit about the interconnectedness because Thanasi just brought that up. So that would be a great question. Okay, great. So my question was, how do you think the interconnectedness of Gen Z due to social media has impacted their political action and advocation? I'm, I'm really interested to see what happens this year. And I want to also make sure we hit um, Kami's question about um, the actual data. So the data is a little scary. Um, so midterm elections are notoriously low turnout and not just for um, Gen Z and younger voters for everyone, but 2018 had historic turnout. Um, and that turnout was 28% um, of, of young voters, which I think sounds alarming, but it was historic and larger than um, normal midterm years. And um, I believe in 2016, we had a 50% um, turnout for people in our voting block. And so these numbers are pretty staggering. Um, and, and frankly, without proper investment, which I, I kind of really haven't seen, um, it's hard to predict what this election will look like. I, I think your question gets at though, like we're in a really interesting moment where now more than ever, young people have had just increased access to information, to this interconnectedness around um, a lot of political issues and around like a super polarizing federal ticket. And so I think it, it could go a lot of ways. <laughs> I'm very, um, I, I'm hopeful that it goes the right way in the sense that like more young people will turn out. But I think it's really hard in this moment because there isn't one action to mobilize around. We have early voting, we have 
mail-in voting. We have lots of new forms of registration that are new in a lot of places. And it's really challenged um, voter reg organizations and organizers because there are all these different things to organize. There's now a vote early day. And then of course we have election day. Um, and I think we're getting a lot of mixed messaging, which makes it really cohesive to organize a campaign around the youth vote. Um, but the youth vote could and hopefully will have a, an immense amount of power in this election and, and really could be the deciding vote, um, which I think is really what we should be focusing on. Um, it's a really sh a shame that more political operatives and funders have not invested in a robust infrastructure for investing in young people because it's more than a snapshot filter it's more than just you know these kind of things i think people think when they think about gen z um it's it's real investment in and in, um paying you young organizers to do the work in their communities and um until i think we see that investment it's going to be hard to hard to tell but um the actual numbers are, are 50 in 2016 and um 2018 28 percent of, of people in the young voting block turned out yeah, I, I, you know, I think back to the election, I'll go even further back to 2008, um, for when, when Obama won his first term, turnout percentage wise for voters between 18 and 29 was slightly larger than for voters over 65. And you can go back and check me, uh, but, that, but that's true. And, you know, I feel like I've been hearing my entire life that young people don't turn out for elections. Um, I think it's also to point out that millennials now uh, are the largest adult generation in the United States. There are more millennials. Uh, according to Pew, there are 73 million millennials and 72 million baby boomers. So there is a generational change. Also, Gen Z plus millennials will be almost 40% of the electorate this year. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how that plays out. But I think that for um, you know, also demographic reasons, uh, you know, as you see, because it's not evenly distributed, um, you know, you do, it is, it is along, largely along generational lines. So you do see different ages as they come through, um, become, or generations, I should say, become voting age. So I think the, the numbers, uh, population wise and different generations are primed to have a really strong, uh, youth turnout this year. Um, but it's, you know, also to, it's very easy to say that younger people don't turn out. But if you look at, you know, the numbers, while it's true that more often older voters turn out, there are notable examples of younger turnout actually, you know, meeting or even superseding older turnout. Yeah, it's also, I think, about the candidate, like President Obama and then then Senator was was very invigorating. He was youthful and his staff knew how to use social media right his staff knew his staff ran the first online marketing campaign in the history of political campaigns if if i or presidential campaigns um and i think right now both campaigns the trump campaign and, and the Biden campaign are failing in invigorating that youth vote and what i'm really worried about is that young people aren't excited about the presidential ticket or any down ballot races because they've been they've witnessed the toxicity of the two-party system and of our democratic system and they're, they're kind of turned off to it. And we've done a horrible job of getting them excited about participating in democracy. Um, educational institutions have, uh, outside institutions have. And, you know, when we, when we put two people on the ticket that are not exciting for any generation, I, I don't see how we can expect young people to come out in droves um, and, and really shift the ballot. But that might be a little bit of a pessimistic opinion on my part. We have 49 days, then I'll see. We can do it. Oh yeah, we're we're tag teaming it. Don't worry. Every every young person is going to be registered in forty nine days. I believe it. <laughs> I want to add one really quick thing because it's sort of a maybe it's a question to the uh, to my fellow panelists. You know, you see, uh, especially with the protests that we've seen in the last several months and the um, organizing of of Black Lives Matter and the focus on you know county sheriff races and DA races. I'm wondering if you think that. It sort of, you know, we, we so often talk about somebody at the top of the ticket, um, you know, helping down ballot. From what I've seen, I think that there could be an opportunity for races to be up ballot and for local races to bring people out because of the fact of how heavily DAs are involved in, uh, you know, uh, holding uh, police officers who commit crimes accountable. Uh, same thing for a state attorneys general, although there are less state attorneys general this year than there were in 2018, but specifically DA and sheriff uh, and other local uh, races, I'm wondering if you think that actually might help up ballot um, in, with, with younger voters. 
Totally. It's the bet I'm making <laughs> because it seems like the only one we can make, I think, at this point, um, this close out. I'm betting on school board races. But um, to your point about DAs, like they're it's this incredible example of a campaign being run um, in the Midwest by all young people, uh, a, a younger guy, um, millennials running for DA, I, I believe in Minis- or Michigan. And his campaign is entirely run in, by young people, by high school students. And it's a really remarkable example of, of I think what you're trying to get out here is, you know, that's, that's what is going to drive a lot of that community to the polls because those young people have been so dedicated to that campaign and have been fighting for um, reform in their community um, and questions of funding police officers, questions of having police in their schools. And I think those are going to be the races that really matter. And I, and I do think, again, that's a, an important thing that's come out of, of COVID. I think we're starting to realize just how many offices matter and also just like our our Congress um, folks who, you know, have had really clear stances on whether they were funding stimulus um, and getting unemployment and getting, I mean, I'm thinking a lot about all the, my own congressman who has been a part of like not voting to increase stimulus for um, public schools and, and a lot of the things that impact our institutions. And so, yeah, I, I think there's a moment here where hopefully these down ballot races do turn people out in greater um, numbers because those are the elections that really, really matter to people's daily lives. Yeah, I hope that will spill over to the the youthful candidates, the younger candidates being supported by high schoolers. I hope that, you know, some of the congressional candidates take stride next election season and and kind of follow that trend. All right, perfect. And I think the next person we have queued up is Kami. Hi, folks. Uh, thanks for this conversation. Super interesting. Um, my question is about what motivates the young voters. You said the candidates are not particularly exciting right now. I'm curious if any of you think voting against either Biden or Trump is a motivator for young people. Um, that's one thought. Is, this, is the anti-vote important? The other c- related question that I have is for issues that are motivating uh, in the USC Dornside Daybreak poll, Out of about 10 issues that were asked of people on the 6,000 panel survey, uh, climate was near the bottom. Uh, And number one was jobs. Uh, Number two was issues of racial justice. Uh, And and I just, I know climate energizes young people, but it didn't seem to really energize anybody else in this panel. And so I wonder if you think young people are going to show up in 2020 uh, for all the reasons that you talked about and whether the anti-vote is a motivator. Thank you. Well, I can, I can at least speak to what I think would help with um, turnout, not in terms of voting for or against somebody, but at really going back to the civics of it and looking at the power of the job. Because if you are voting for president, what are you voting for? You're voting to give, not, not the political party, I'm not talking about the individual, I'm talking about the power of the office. What are you voting for? You're voting for somebody to nominate federal judges. You're voting for somebody to nominate, including Supreme Court judges. You're nominating for someone to, uh, uh, you're voting for someone to then you know, nominate and select the members of the cabinet for everything from uh, uh, healthcare to, to energy, to defense, to, to labor, to all the other cabinet positions. You're voting for someone who has the ability to pardon federal crimes. You're voting for someone who has the ability to you know, lead our country as commander in chief. Um, I think when you look at the list of all the things that the president can do, per, not to bring it always back to the constitution, but per the constitution, you know, that helps then deciding which person you want in that role. But I think because of our news media, because of our lack of civic education focus in schools, we're either focusing on the person, the individual, uh, or the political party. Um, But we're not as much focusing on the actual power of the office. And when somebody isn't motivated enough to turn out for a person or for a party or for an ideology, I think when you look at the power on paper, um, that is going to help motivate somebody to, to turn out when you don't have someone who's a charismatic, uh, a, a leader or connecting on a, on a personal level. Yeah, totally. And I, I also think that um, young people are waiting, um, not waiting, but they, they want 
candidates who represent their views. They want forward thinking candidates. They want people who are, you know, not both candidates. Well, one of the candidates has been a, a very involved in the political system since the seventies. And another candidate has been very involved in legacy institutions, backroom deals. They're, they're both, you know, they're both traditional Washington. They're, they're the people that young people don't want anymore in power. They want new ideas. They want progressive candidates. And I think, you know, once those candidates make it through the party platforms that are blocking them right now, we're going to see a surge in youth involvement in politics over the next 10 years. Gen Z is going to be the largest uh, voting block, I think, by 2030. Um, and when that happens, candidates are going to have to rise to meet their demands, not the other way around. All right. I think we ended on time perfectly. So that was it from our panel, like our group questions. Um, so we are going to end the event here. Um, just to remember that you can register to vote USC students with the link that we've given there. And the National Voter Registration Day is a week from today. Um, to date, that national holiday has registered over 3 million voters on that day. So that's fun. Um, come jump, come join, register to vote, be a part of that number. Um, so thank you all for coming. And this will be recorded and uploaded to all of our CPF platforms and go ahead and subscribe to our newsletter so that we never miss another event. Thank you once again to Ben, Merritt, Vanasi. That was an amazing conversation. I hope this expands past the Zoom call and into every single discussion in the classrooms and you know, wherever we young people hang out at. Thank you once again.